Achteraf zou ze zeggen, wat is er eigenlijk gebeurd? Ik heb van mezelf opgekeken. We liepen dwars door de zon naar een parkeerterrein. De wereld was licht en luchtig na vier uur in de studio. Van mezelf opgekeken? Maar waarom eigenlijk? Omdat ze zo openlijk over haar gestorven man praten en over het leven na dit leven? Omdat ze anders dan gewoonlijk geen toespraak had gehouden tot de wereld, maar herinneringen had opgehaald aan Fifi en David Craybeard en het woud daar in Afrika, in Gombi? Omdat ze tenslotte bijna achterloos vertelde dat ze zo ongelooflijk weinig weet van de chimpansees die ze al veertig jaar bestudeert? Was het daarom? Keek ze vreemd op van haar antwoord op de vraag waar ze eigenlijk troost zoekt als het leven tegen zit? Ik weet het nog steeds niet en zei evenmin. Maar we liepen de studio uit, dwars door de zon en ze zei ik heb van mezelf opgekeken. Ever since I was a very small child, there was something about trees. I loved trees. When I was growing up in England, there was one special tree in the garden, beech tree. Not a very big one, but for me it was big. And I used to climb into it, and I would sit up there close to the birds, and they'd seem to sound different, and I'd hear the wind going through the leaves. And it was just such a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I was too young at that time to really, to really understand how that quiet, peaceful beauty of being up with the leaves and the flowers is a way of, of connecting to the world as it could be, should be. And it, it's the consolation to me, the trees give me the consolation of knowing that it's still there for us. We just have to reach out and take it. And it's, it's all around us. The world as it should be, the world not as it the world be. as it is. Not the world as it is, the world as it... There are little glimpses all around us of a reality that's stronger than the mess that we've made of the world. So when I finally got to Africa and went into the real rainforest, and the beauty there is so amazing with the... the the greys and the greens and the browns and the intertwining of life so that everything depends on everything else and the little flashes of colour as the butterflies flutter by above you and the little leaves that f flutter down when the wind blows and the dancing specks of sunlight that come onto the ground through the canopy far above or if you lie on your back and you gaze up you see these pinpoints of light like moving stars in the, in the green canopy. And the peace of it, and the timelessness of it, and that's, that's very, very real. That is so far untouched by our destructive species. And it, it is great consolation to my soul to know that such places are, and always have been, and I believe always will be. Innocent places, also, the sense. Innocent. Not touched by us humans yet. Yes, in, innocent. There is, of course, always... I mean, there's a constant cycle of life and death. And life comes from death. And you get a, a better understanding of death being part of life. And it was from the forest that I sought consolation after the death of my late husband. 
and I went back there and to spent Cumbria. time just mm -hmm. just being with the forest, being with the chimpanzees, and getting this feeling of eternity, and the if you can say it, the rightness of dying. You're born and you know you have to die. At least your mortal body dies. I don't believe the spirit dies. You don't? No. Did you always believe it? I have always believed um, in life after life. Mm -hmm. And it was after my husband died that, for me anyway, I had proof for myself. There's nothing I would ever try and make anyone else believe. But I was convinced. I had these strange experiences, these connections, which gave me great joy. And uh, for me, was proof enough. Connections to what? Connections to, to him, to connections to my husband after he'd gone. I mean, there was, the, there was his presence there, so strong. Did he appear in a dreamlike state or um, clear daylight? Did you talk to him? Did he advise you? What happened? There were two completely separate occasions, but they were both on the same day. So when I, when I went back to Gombe, where he and I had spent many, many happy hours, and he loved, he loved the forest too. And of course, he, he, he got wounded in the Second World War. His plane was shot down. Mm -hmm. So he walked with great difficulty with a stick. And he always loved watching the chimpanzees and their graceful movement in the trees just because he couldn't walk. So he loved to watch ballet and things like that. And so I was very sad when I got there and I went back to the house where we'd been so happy together. Mm -hmm. And then I was walking up the slope to where the chimps are through the forest. And there was, there's one place where it's pretty steep and we had little steps cut for him so that it was a bit easier for him to go up. And I am trailing up these steps and suddenly I start laughing because there's this presence which is now light it's now easy for him to go up and he's teasing me and it was this extraordinary feeling Just I running. suddenly found yeah he, would, he was light weightless yeah and so that started my day with a smile and then that evening I didn't think I'd sleep um, because it's pretty lonely down there in the evening making my own little supper on my own little fire you know and but I did sleep and then, I don't know if it was a dream, I have no idea what happened, but I thought I was asleep, and then there was Derek, and he was telling me so many incredibly important things. And he was very joyful. About very what? About his new state of being. He's free from pain and everything. Where did he live? What did he tell about uh, his surroundings? Uh, well, wait. He okay. was telling me all these wonderful things. Yeah. And as I'm thinking, I've got to remember this. This is so important. This is a message for the rest of my life. I must remember it. Suddenly, this great roaring came. And I thought I was going to faint. And um, gradually, uh, the roaring went away. And so my mind came back. And I thought, now I've got to remember what Derek said, with which the roaring started again. And I actually thought I would die. I wasn't frightened at all. And after the roaring stopped the second time, like a rushing wind, I couldn't remember. All I could remember was the joyful presence and this important message that I no longer could grasp. But I think it's there. Did you know I, it's, it was there? Yes, and I talked to, um, I mean, I've never talked to a medium before, but this was one that my grandmother had twice spoken to after she had very strange dreams. And so I, I couldn't see this medium because her husband had just died and she'd retired, but she spoke to me on the phone and she said the same thing happened to her and that she had tried to get out of bed to write down what her husband had said and she'd passed out. She was unconscious on the ground. She said, if it happens to you again, don't try and move. And I said, well, what do you think it was? And she said, well, I don't know, but I think that this communication is at a different plane and if you try and rush back to your plane too quickly, um, you, could, you could actually die. A little thread can be lost. I don't know. I mean, I have no idea what it, what it really meant. But for me, it was a, a proof, all the proof I needed. The proof for this life after is life, not the only one. That we do not end when we die. I've always thought that. And this made it stronger. 
You'll meet Derek again. I'll meet Derek again. Maybe not as Derek. I don't pretend to know what it's going to be like. But you met him as Derek. I met him as Derek. Yeah. And then I had, I had this very strange feeling that lasted for, for about, I don't know, six, nine months to a year, that, that he was around, and I wasn't talking to him or anything like that, but I knew he was there. And there were certain things that he loved. He loved the sea. He loved to watch these great waves breaking. And I had this really strong feeling that in his spirit state, he couldn't really experience that anymore. But that if I looked at it with real concentration through me, he could for a little while hold on to those earthly beauties that had meant so much to him in his life. So I would watch the sea and I would lie on the beach so that the waves would come breaking in with the sun shining through them and try and experience them with every piece of my body. And the same where I would watch ballet for him. And it was, you know, this gradually went away and I thought, yes, now he's moved to wherever he's supposed to be. But it was, for me, it was a very intense period of, of experiencing certain beauties far more than I ever would have otherwise. In order that Derek could... could. Yes. And so there came, you know, again, the consolation of, of knowing that these things have meaning beyond, beyond the transient sense of joy that we get in this life. It's not a belief. You're certain about it. I am certain about it. I have faith about it. And you it. are a rationalist. I'm a, I think I'm a rationalist, You always yes. are, yeah. I mean, I have never, ever seen a conflict between science and religion. I just don't see that it's there. And so I've always managed to weave the two things, you know, a belief in this great spiritual power. I feel that's so strong around, something you can derive strength from. For you, it's the ultimate consolation to know that there is a kind of afterlife. Whatever it may be. That you will meet Derek again, like the others, like Flo. Like Flo. Like Rusty, the dog I grew uh, up with. David Greybeard. David Greybeard. You'll meet him again. I will meet him again. In some form, but I'll know. You're not sure about the form. You're no. not sure about their appearance. No. Or if they are changed. No, totally. I don't know. It or doesn't seem to matter. Yes. Yes. Can you still remember vividly the first time you went into the bush, into the forest, after Derek died, when you returned to Combi? Was it one particular day you can remember, or an overall feeling of, OK, here is the forest, here is my consolation, now I can reconcile with Derek's dying? Mm. There were, there were two experiences in that time which still are very, very vivid. And one was when I'd been following the chimps and it was very wet. And I was cold and miserable and so were they, I think. And then they climbed into this tree and because it had been raining, the branches were very black. It was that kind of wood, very black branches. And the little leaves that they were feeding on, they were very small new buds just beginning to to sprout into leaves, and the sun had come out, so it was shining on these green leaves, which are very vividly green, and the, the branches were shining ebony, and behind was this dark, dark, dark black-purple sky where the storm was going away over the lake, and the thunder was rumbling in the distance, but it had gone, and the chimps were up there feeding, and the sun was lighting up their, their, their black coats with the little sheen of, you get this little sheen of, of reddish colour in the sun. And, you know, suddenly it was just this amazing, I felt I was really part of this world and everything I could experience with a different sense. And I could smell the chimp's hair wet in the rain and my own hair wet in the rain. And I actually sensed a bushbuck before I saw him. I don't know if, if I smelled him or probably heard him and then so I looked over and yes there he was and he had these beautiful spiraled horns again they were dark because they were wet and his chestnut coat was dark but still shining with specks of sun he didn't see me he didn't run away he just slowly walked through 
and you know all the leaves each one so perfect and this incredible spider's web with its shining jewels of dewdrops raindrops and that was, it was like a mystical experience i can't recapture that in feeling in mm -hmm. detail now i can't i can't be at that level of of experience i can remember having it i can't feel it again but i did try to write it it's down. like a, a proustian experience yes you can remember that that very moment you were happy but you can't relive it i can't i can't relive it but i did write about it you know when fifi w went off to join the other chimps i stayed and i wrote because it was you know it was very important for me to try and remember that so that was one experience and then the other one was when I was following some chimps and there's this amazing waterfall and it drops about 80 feet and it's during the aeons of time it's worn a, a passage into the solid rock so it's falling down and makes a great wind as it enters this rocky channel and sometimes the chimpanzees do these amazing Re uh, waterfall displays and they'll do this rhythmic moving from side to side they stand upright they get big rocks from the stream bed and they throw them and then they'll sometimes climb the little thin thin vines that hang down and sway out into the spray and then sometimes they'll climb down and sit on a rock and just gaze at the water i mean they'll watch it coming down and going past and what is this water? It's always coming, it's always going, but it's always here. And I think if they had a spoken language like we do, if they could discuss the idea, the perhaps a feeling of awe that causes this magnificent display, then we'd have one of the um, early sort of animistic religions where early humans or some people worship the elements the magic mystery of the elements. I think that would happen. But anyway, I remember one of the chimps did this amazing display and the others were watching and the figs were falling as they were eating them. There was this beautiful smell of figs. And again, it was, yeah, life is going on and there's magic and there's a lot to learn and Derek's dead. But so is this tree over here dead, and the dead tree is giving life to all this other host of plants that are growing up from it, and the ferns, and the insects that are nesting there. So it was just it was quite a special day. Were you reconciled at that very moment with? I was reconciled with life as it is. And with Derek dying. And with Derek dying. Totally at peace with the world. At peace with the world. It wasn't, there was never a moment when I said, Oh, it's okay that Derek said that. That didn't happen, but it was a gradual thing, and the the moments of acceptance came, came more often. It was, it was very very consoling being in this complete beauty, and again, no demands made. No, you didn't have to keep up a pretense of being happy if you weren't. If you cried a bit, it didn't matter because the chimps didn't care two hoots, so they were there. Try to describe in detail, you're sitting in the forest, alone. Is being alone a precondition for this kind of happiness, of exaltation, of... No, there's two, kinds of, there's two kinds of ways to enjoy the forest or any other natural beauty. Mm. And one is to be completely alone. And I think for me that's the best because you, you then forget. You forget about humans altogether. And you can just completely, um, you completely feel and be a part of the beauty without, without any intrusive humanity coming into it. And so you, you tend to, to really, well, I always feel I can feel the sap going up in the trees and they feel so alive. And, you know, looking at the shapes of the vines and this beautiful moss and the, the ferns and every leaf different and the forest floor, this soft bed of, of moss mm -hmm. or, or, or leaves that have fallen, and the little rustling animals, and never quite knowing what you'll see, 
and maybe a bush pig will appear and there could be a leopard around. So there's always the element of what am I going to see? It's always new. There's always something. You can always see a new behavior in some little insects. Watch the squirrels and their roundabout patterns as they scrabble up the branches. And then the little rustling breeze. And I remember once, which was so amazing that there was this light breeze and it was when the leaves were falling, so they're yellow and red. And the, the slight breeze blew and these leaves came fluttering down, you know, occasionally bumping a living leaf or a leaf still attached and then changing course. But it was like a cloud coming down. And as this cloud came lower from the forest floor, there were a whole lot of butterflies there. And as the first leaves touched down, the butterflies flew up. So you had the leaves falling down and this cloud of butterflies flying up and the sun shining through them. And it was exquisite. It was the most amazing moment. So being there on your own, I think you, you can somehow feel all of this better. But it's also wonderful to be in a beautiful place with somebody you love. And then it's a sharing. It's a different, it's a different appreciation of the beauty and the human element comes into it. What's the better part of the experience with or without humans? Without, for me. And I think maybe I feel a little guilty about that because I feel so lucky the places I've seen. And maybe this is why I really try to keep hold of them and try to be able to share them and write about them so that other people can share in this. But even not at that very moment. Not at that very moment, somehow. What's the blessing of being alone? I understand it perfectly, I must say, but what's the blessing? Um, there's no demands on you. The forest has no demands on me. It doesn't care whether I'm there or not. Whereas if I'm with another person, uh, that person may expect me to speak. I may be a little tense because I don't want anybody to speak at that moment. Um, nor do I want to disturb the other person by doing something that might be irritating. And if I'm trying to, not trying to get lost in the beauty, but if I am lost in the beauty and the other person will shuffle a leaf or I'm watching a butterfly and somehow the other person disturbs the butterfly, it's little irritants that take away from that perfect experience of peace. Let's have a look at him. David Greybeard. David Greybeard. Well, of all the combi chimpanzees, it's David Greybeard whom I have loved the most, you wrote. And I still do. Yeah? Um, David was the first chimpanzee to lose his fear of me. And it was because he lost his fear that the others would, would watch in amazement because sometimes David would wander towards me instead of running away and they'd stop they were ready to flee and they'd stop and watch with big eyes and nothing happened to David and so they began to realize that I wasn't after all so terrifying you know they'd never seen a white ape before and they're very conservative and I don't know why he lost his fear like that but he did and he had uh, you, you, you don't know no, I don't know. You don't no have idea. the slightest idea why he was the first to, to embrace you, to say, okay, you're welcome. Absolutely no idea. The most amazing experience with David Greybeard, the most, probably one of the highlights of the entire 40 years, was when I was following David. It was just after I was actually able to follow him. Because it's one thing to come upon a group of chimps and sit and watch them and then they go away. It's quite another thing if they trust you enough to let you actually follow them. That's different. And he just begun to allow me to follow him. And he went through some thorny undergrowth and I was sure I'd lost him because you know I was getting caught in the thorns and stuff. And I came through and there he was sitting almost as though he'd been waiting and he may have been. And he was sitting by a little stream and I sat there too and lying on the floor was a ripe red oil nut from the oil nut palm, which the chimps love. And so I picked it up and I held it out to him and he reached out 
and he took it with a movement rather like this. And he obviously didn't want it, so he dropped it to the ground, but with the same movement, he very gently held my hand and gave it a slight pressure, which was as much as to say, well, I don't want the nut, but I'm going to reassure you because I know why you gave it to me. And the amazing thing about that was the chimps reassure each other with this gentle pressure. But it was as though it was perfect communication with absolutely no need for words. And that was a communication, I think, which we and the chimpanzees have shared for maybe five million years, going back to a common ancestor, a half ape, half cute human creature. Yeah, a terrific moment. That was that Where was beauty a, and consolation meet. And Absolutely. A breakthrough moment. Yeah. And the chimpanzees do, without any question, they bridge these two worlds, the human world and the rest of the animal kingdom. And they, they show us clearly there's no sharp line dividing us from them and leads you to a new respect. They teach that it's not only humans with personality, rational thought, and the ability to know emotions like joy, mm. sadness, fear, despair. A flow. It was a bright, clear morning when I received news of her death. I had known her for 11 years, and I had loved her. Was your love for Flo as intense as it was for David Crabier? Yes. She is appearing in your books, Time and Again, her whole family, her offspring. It, 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 was, it, wasn't, it wasn't quite the same as for David. Her character was different, but I still loved her. And I don't know that you can compare loves in a way. Was it as intense? It was a different kind of a love, a different kind of relationship. She was a different personality. And I loved her personality. She was fearless. She would do anything to protect her children. She taught me so much about motherhood and patience and support and caring. And From her, you learned something about motherhood. I learned a lot from Flo about motherhood. And, and when she died, and I knew that I you know, would never see her again. The forest lost a little bit of its sparkle for a little while because there was no flow in it anymore. And then, of course, her son Flint died of grief. And that was truly tragic. We did try to help him. It didn't work. How did you try to help him? We f offered him Oh, what food. happened with him after Flo died? Well, after Flo died, uh, she died lying half in the stream. And he was with her. He was already eight and a half years old. We had this strange, abnormal dependency, I think because she'd been too old to push him into independence. And chimps have to push a little bit, just like we do, and um, or we sometimes do. And so after she died, he was sitting there beside the body, and he would go down and pull at her hand. He'd always been begging her to groom him when she was alive, pestering her in a way. And he pulled at her hand as though, you know, please, why don't you groom me? And then he was sitting up on the bank of the stream, and going down and grooming her a bit and pulling at her hand. And then one time he came down, and the flies had already found this dead body, although it was very fresh, and laid a few eggs and in her ear. And he stared at this. And of course, chimps are familiar with dead bodies. They find them in the forest. And he scratched at the egg and sniffed his finger. And then it was very strange. He rushed up the bank and he kept going like this with his hand on the, on the bank and sniffing it and going like this. And he never went near the body again. So it was as though he suddenly understood. But from then on, he didn't want to eat. He didn't want to interact with the others. And in this state of what I can only describe as grief, you know, with his immune system weakened, he fell sick and he was dead within a month. What do chimps if they are mourning? I mean, sadness. How do you notice sadness? What are they doing? Withdrawn hunched. Um, there's a, 
a dead look in the eyes. They don't take part in social interactions, keep themselves away, spend a lot of time just lying. The, the whole pace of life is, is suppressed. We can't compare our consciousness, perhaps, uh, with the consciousness of the chimps. We can compare our emotions. We can compare our Am emotions, I right? yes. Chimps almost certainly have a consciousness of self. Mm -hmm. They can recognize that I'm me and that's you. And there are, you know, there are certain experiments done in captivity which more or less show that they do recognize themselves as themselves. Mm -hmm. But concerning emotions, uh, after the loss of, you're told about Flint, uh, but the others, uh, when they are sad, miserable, sick, uh, how do they behave and how... They, they, they will tend to, if they're it's older It's the same ones, way I'm behaving or you're behaving. Separating themselves, getting away, curling up, keeping, you know, lying there with their misery. That's basically what they do. And, you know, you see, you'll see, for example, when we're less extreme than death, for a young chimp of four, when the mother starts weaning them, discouraging them from riding her back, preventing them more and more often from suckling, and they go through what we call weaning depression, a lot of <laughs> crying. Is this the sound of crying? Cry sound of crying. Mm -hmm. So when a young chimp's being weaned, you'll hear through the forest this And then <laughs> they're trying to suckle, they'll lean away like this. <laughs> and then they may throw this tantrum. And the weaning depression can last oh, about three, three months, as long as three months. But if the mother joins another female who's got a youngster, then play, and then they forget that they're miserable. But then as soon as they're on their own with their mother again, this sadness comes back. So they can be distracted from it. Whereas the orphans who've lost their mothers, who become really depressed, they, they resist, they don't play. In fact, if somebody comes and tries to play with them, they'll show aggression instead. They just they refuse. withdraw, yeah. Yeah, they don't want to play that. They're, they're too miserable to want to play. Mm -hmm. And sometimes die, and sometimes gradually recover. Do you talk to them, to them now and then, to Flo, to David Craybeard? Oh, I used to. Yeah, I used to talk for several reasons. In the early days, you know, when they finally got used to me, yeah. I would sometimes talk as I approached them so that they'd know it was me. It's that queer thing again, don't worry. And so I, I sometimes used to talk to Flo. And something very strange happened. I used to call her Flo Flo. And when we had all the big males and we were feeding bananas, and it wasn't very, wasn't very good at all. It was not organized well. But I would sometimes want to give Flo a banana, and the big males would be there. And so sometimes I kind of sneak off behind the bushes and quietly say, Flo, Flo, she learned her name. We don't call them by their names now, but, and Fifi knew her name too. And they would sometimes just quietly get up and nonchalantly walk away as though there's nothing special happening. Um, and get their banana. And about two years after Flo died, I was sitting with Fifi. Her daughter. Her daughter. And I just said, without really thinking, I said to Fifi, well, do you miss old Flo Flo like I do? And Fifi just jumped, and she started looking all around and up in the tree, and I thought, oh, what have I done? Flo Flo, the sound? She just was looking for her mother. It was quite uncanny. I didn't think that, that, that she would show that reaction. But she looked, you know, all around. Is she here? Is she really here? Strange. Strange. Mm. And Fifi, all my Tanzanian field staff absolutely are convinced that Fifi knows when I'm coming. And indeed, like eight times out of ten, is there? If, if she hasn't been around for a while, 
within 48 hours of my arrival, she appears and she'll come up and she'll sit about uh, five feet away from me and she just sits there um, and she'll look into my eyes and I just sit and look at, look at her and then after a bit she'll wander away. That's very strange. What do you say to her? What do you tell her? Do you tell her while I was in England? Do you talk to them in a way you talk to me, for instance? No. Or are you just making the same sounds? And no, I don't talk to her anymore, at least hardly. Deep silence? Silence. Just body language or what? Signing? No. Nothing of that sort? Just being there. Mm -hmm. Just sharing the same space. What's happening? Fifi is sitting there. You're sitting next to Fifi. One, two meters. What's happening? It's just a sort of an acknowledgement, um, some kind of communication, obviously, but it's not, it's not with human words. It's just a recognition of each other's being, I suppose. Just drink your coffee in between. Otherwise, it's cold again. Do you realize that was telepathy? What do you say? I caused you to say that. <laughs> I didn't look at my cup, right? No. But within two seconds of my thinking, the coffee's said, getting gold, you said two for seconds. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> two but seconds. Now, now I know Took why I'm asking the, the wrong questions. <laughs> they're not mine, they're yours. Oh, really? Weren't mine. They're yours. Mm -hmm. Well. It's cold or not? No, oh, it's lukewarm. It's just right for the throat. Well. Can we continue? Mm -hmm. Are you I stop. Allowed to? <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny, though. It was absolutely funny. What, the moment you were thinking, okay, now. Yeah, it was literally two while. seconds that you said it. Yeah. What's the conclusion? Now, it depends. Well, it depends if you thought about it before you said it. Did you? Uh huh. No. You suddenly, it was like, oh. Yes. You looked at the well, cup. Well, I stopped for a moment because. Because I was thinking of the cup when you said it. Well, it's logical, isn't it? Maybe. We were talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't drink. logical at all. Come on. You I'm can't get out of it that easily. So. <laughs> Sitting at the peak, I remember you writing about it several times. It's a magic spot, isn't it? It's a fantastic spot because you have this... If there are places of pure beauty, it's the peak. Well, the peak, the peak puts you outside the forest, so you're looking yeah. around at the forest and you have this wonderful view of what's going on around you. And it's rather like being on a ship and the wind comes in and you've got the lake below you. So this is, this is enabling you to look around and see it as a whole and get the whole picture. Whereas when you're in the forest, you're, you're part of the forest. Yeah. On the peak, you're outside of it, looking down on it. You're part of a bigger world. It's a different feeling, just as beautiful. If you come home, a home, H-O-M-E, is a place where you're not frightened, yes. not afraid. Yes. Was that the case when you came to Combe for the first time? That you, f in the forest itself, you felt more or less at home, not I, afraid of the animal, animals. There were times when I was extremely afraid of the animals, because I think you'd be a bit dumb if you weren't. Yeah. When you hear a leopard or you, you hear a buffalo near you, it'd be a bit stupid if you didn't try and you know, get out of the way. But I had this, this very strong conviction that I was meant to be there, and it was almost like a sort of pact with God, although I didn't think of it in those terms. You know, you look after me and keep me safe, and I'll do this thing which I'm supposed to be doing. And it, would, it wasn't actually like that. But um, 
I, I can remember sometimes I would climb back up to the peak after supper and it would be dark, of course, and there'd be all these strange rustlings and night sounds. And I would have my little torch and there'd be this little circle of light and it felt as though in this circle of light I'm safe. And then I'd finally get up to the peak and that was home. Then I was perfectly safe. I had my little hut there. It wasn't built for me to sit in. It was built to keep a little tin trunk. And I had some coffee and a little kettle, and I could make a little fire there. And it was totally home. I had a blanket, and I could sleep near the chimps. Alone? Alone. Alone? Alone. Time and again? Time and again. And then sitting there on the peak in the moonlight, looking down where the moonlight makes the palm frond silver shining and it's shining on the lake and it's just and you know the, there's that misty quality in the air when the moon shines out at the periphery you see a few little stars but not many because the moon is so bright enchanting true true magic 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 and I've always found the no night... words to express it any further no Harmony with the cosmos, uh, something like that. Well, I could say it was harmony with, yeah, harmony with creation. Yeah. I'm intrigued. Are there any more words to describe that feeling? Uh, in the middle of the night, at the peak, one blanket, the stars, the sounds of the forest. What sounds are there at night? What do you hear when you it's hear, dark? You hear, um, the, it's usually a slight rustling of palm fronds and leaves. There's the crickets, occasionally a baboon barks, mm -hmm. perhaps a leopard has gone wandering by. Occasionally you hear a leopard. Uh, sometimes if a baboon barks, then a chimp will give his alarmed call. That's about the most noises, sometimes a bush buck gives an alarm call. And you, at that same time, are you thinking, reflecting, or just absorbing? I'm basically just being, but appreciating the beauty. I mean, it was Walter de la Mer who said, look thy last on all things lovely every hour. Uh -huh. And I've always kept that very much in mind. And I think that's why I find it easy to recall a lot of these beautiful moments, because I, I think about them when I'm living them. I've always found that when you are at night with the stars, never mind where, that there is something very humbling. And, you know, you feel so tiny, so tiny. This universe is so great. And all our problems seem to almost fade away and become absurd because we're such minute specks and the universe is so vast. Mm -hmm. And all our troubles and problems in perspective seem so infinitesimal. And yet at the same time, you suddenly realize you've got a mind which can encompass this whole universe and this whole huge vastness. We can't understand eternity. Um, we can't understand space, at least I don't think we can, with our finite minds. We can't understand infinity, but we can understand the concepts of infinity and timelessness and space, and how, it, how incredible that all is. So it's a, it's a, it is a mystical feeling of, on the one moment, being reduced to nothing, and the next moment realizing, but it's all within me. It's, it's all part of a whole. The symbiosis of the, the, the smallest and the largest. Yes. And so the stars do put you in perspective and they keep you, they keep you very much in tune with, with, the, with the whole harmony of the natural world. They keep alive a sense of reverence and awe, I think the stars do. And then when you combine the stars with, 
being somewhere extremely beautiful, wherever that may be, that adds a whole new dimension somehow. And up on the peak, well, it was the days of discovery. It was the expectation that something might happen that would be exciting. I mean, a leopard might cough very close by, and sometimes they did. And then there was just, it was so exquisitely beautiful and mystical and magical. And the fact that I was actually there, sometimes that would burst upon me and I'd think, how could I possibly have been so lucky as to be here by myself in this amazing, fantastic world? And did any of it ever get boring? Never. never. I've never been bored in the... Never? I've never been bored in the forest. Don't believe you. I've been bored sometimes if you have a specific job and you're waiting for a chimp to come to a tree and the chimp uh -huh. doesn't come. And then the, you know, there's still a little bit that we carry the baggage and I'm here to do a job and I mustn't let Louis come leaky on, down. Come on, you bastard, I'm waiting, yeah. And, you know, where's the chimp? And f for that time, you just stop looking. You stop looking and you stop being aware of where you are. But if you can just flick that away, and, and you can, you consciously can, and come back into where you actually are, and return to a being state of being in that world. And I think one thing that's, that's, that really struck me the other day is, this was when a, just a simple fly landed on me, but we get some very exquisite flies. And this one was shining green and gold, and it had little specks of red, its eyes were red. It was, and I, I'm sure it's never been described. It was a beautiful fly bristly fur on its on its abdomen and I looked at it and I thought you know when a chimpanzee looks at something like this he doesn't have a word he doesn't have the word fly so he's looking at it as it is and he's looking at it I don't know that a chimp feels amazement I'm imagining now myself being in the situation of not having words so if I can't categorize it as a fly that takes away from something of the of the beauty of the moment because, oh, it's just a fly. So forget fly and just look at, at this little being that's there. And it, it's a whole different feeling when you take the word away. So, chimps? Well, I don't know what, if, if I could get in the mind of a chimp for just one minute, it would save us, you know, maybe another 50 years of research. We still don't know how a chimp looks at the world. How does a chimp's mind work? I don't know. We, we know they can learn many, many signs of ASL, American Sign Language. They can be taught to name an object or with, with a sign. Can you explain to them the word beauty so that they point at things they are experience, experiencing as beautiful? Yes, I think so. I mean, I don't work in, with sign language, I know, so I don't know. But possible. I would imagine you could take a whole and I don't know if they get the concept of beauty. I don't know. Maybe not the same as, they couldn't do it the same as us, I don't think. They haven't any concept of beauty, perhaps? Well, I think they enjoy looking at certain things. I mean, Such sometimes, as? well, sometimes they're looking Bananas. As, well, bananas are exciting and food. delicious. Yeah. And they're food, and they give a great sense of well-being and happiness. And they can anticipate Shouting, too. embracing, yes. like two Frenchmen. <laughs> like I two Frenchmen know. or two football fans. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or two people who meet after a separation. Uh -huh. The chimps do much the same. But they will sometimes gaze when the sky is very, very red in the evening. And before they make their nest, they'll sit. Maybe they're appreciating a sunset. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. I do not know. And Isn't I, that I, a little bit disappointing? We're talking about beauty and consolation. I ask you after, what is the chimpanzee feeling of beauty? Let's later talk about consolation. You haven't the slightest idea. I haven't the slightest idea. And that's, that's what makes this study so amazing. There's still so much that we don't know. And will there ever be a way of seeing through the eyes of a chimp? I doubt it. I doubt it. 
I mean, we have, we can guess pretty well sometimes, but when it comes to things like, like beauty, that's, it's more than an abstract term. It's a whole, what is it? It's a whole, um, it's the way we relate to and interpret the things around us that move us. And we call it beauty, close to joy, I think. I mean, the ode to joy, that great triumph of Beethoven, is beauty and it's joy, and it moves your soul. The chimps sitting, looking at a sunset. He's seeing you the colors. But, but you can see joy or sadness or mm -hmm. chimps crying. Yes. But experiencing beauty? Something different. Yeah. I mean, let, let's take this sunset. I imagine that an artist, human, would see it one way. A poet might see it in a different way. Different images would be conjured up. Um, a philosopher might see something else. A scientist would probably have a completely different feeling about it. So there we are, these different humans with our different beliefs, our cultures, our backgrounds, our experiences. And so we look on the world around us and we see, we interpret what we see in very different ways. We pick out what we see. Mm -hmm. Some people will, will pick out little tiny things and see them as beautiful. Other people won't even notice them. Yeah. The shape of a wet leaf on the pavement, even in an ugly place. A footstep on the sand filling up with water. Uh, the whole picture that you can get. A child's footprint and a dog's paw and the tide coming in. It can be very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Other people might just tramp over them and not see them at yeah. all. And not think they're beautiful. So I don't think we can, we can possibly expect to ever understand what a chimp. What a chimp thinks about beauty when we can't really even understand it in ourselves, except, I mean, I can understand what I feel is beautiful. But there's absolutely no expectation on my part that you might see a lot of these things as beautiful. Now, what could be the uh, evolutionary reason for the fact that we are developing a sense of the beautiful? because we've developed this sophisticated spoken language. Our forebrain has evolved. We communicate ideas, and once you start communicating an idea about beauty, then I think you learn to think in different ways. Because suddenly, it's not only your own experience, but it's others. Suddenly, you're forced to put into words what before you have only felt or visualized. And so the whole concepts begin to evolve and develop, and we get artists, we get poets, we get writers, we get philosophers. But why? What's the evolutionary reason? I believe that we humans are evolving from very primitive creatures who just have the main reason for existence, finding food and recreating, um, propagating to a more spiritual kind of life on Earth, a more moral kind of life on Earth. And so I think that all this is part of our cultural evolution, our moral evolution, and our spiritual evolution. Are we talking about contingency now? Or are we talking about evolution leading in a certain direction to a more complicated, more awareness. Uh, yes, I, that's what I'm talking about. I think yeah. you see, you can trace this. St Stephen Jay Gould wrote a prologue for one of your books. Yes. He wouldn't agree. No. He wouldn't. No. That doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> We're terribly no boring. No contingency involved. It's just leading to something. So I'm, there, are, there are all kinds of, I mean, there's, there's, there's all kinds of ways I suppose we could have gone. Um, I don't know. If we had another planet and we had other beings evolving towards a more per perfect and spiritual type of being, which I think we are, would they look like us? No, they probably wouldn't. Would they think what we think is beautiful, beautiful? They might. That, that, I mean, this is what, why living is so exciting, really, because you're surrounded by differing views. 
Um, all the time you're learning, all the time you, gosh, I never thought of it like that before. And as long as you can keep your mind open, and you know, the, the huge danger that I see around us in the world today are these blinkered people who see only one narrow view and they don't really want to change. They, they're mm -hmm. just happy, or, well, they think they're happy um, in this little rut, um, heading kind of from nowhere to nowhere as far as I can see. But if I say evolution is contingency, evolution has no direction, evolution has no goal, you disagree or not? Yes, I disagree. But why? I don't know why, because... Intuition, or...? It's probably intuition. You're male, are I'm female. Are we talking science now, or are we talking no. your personal...? Look, I never wanted to be a scientist. Uh -huh. That wasn't a goal of mine. I wanted to live in Africa. <clears throat> I wanted to live in Africa, study animals, and write books about them. I think I probably... Um, um, far more of, you know, the artistic side, the, the writer's side, poetry. I learn to express my observations in a scientific way, and I'm eternally grateful for that. It forces you to self-discipline. You think things through. And these two factions, I think, for me anyway, they, they make a, a very nice complementation to each other. Or rather, they complement each other very well, the artistic side. Uh -huh and the more logical side. But I have intuition about things which I don't even try to explain because I can't. Why do I think we're evolving towards a more moral and spiritual being and that there's a purpose? I suppose because I've seen it kind of happening in evolution. What? What? You're talking about purpose. What purpose? <clears throat> well, it depends whether you believe in a god or not, depends whether you I believe don't. there's a purpose for us being here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't exactly know what the purpose, basically, of humans on Earth or any life form on Earth is. I have felt increasingly that my life has a purpose which is dictated by something outside myself, which you won't agree with, but it doesn't matter to me. Um, you know, this is what keeps, gives me the fuel to keep me doing what I'm doing. And at the very least, what I think I'm doing is giving hope to very, very, very many people. And I think that because they tell me so. And I think to have hope today when so much seems hopeless is terribly important. I mean, think of being born into a world which has been despoiled, not by you, and having no hope as a young child. It's a tragedy. It's a mission. For me, mm -hmm. yes. And you I have can't, to. I have to, I have to, and I can't. You're ordered to I'm, do so. I'm, no, I'm not ordered. I have a choice. Yet there's somebody, someone, or whatever you call it, saying, Jane Goodall. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, you know, when I went into Notre Dame, and suddenly heard this Bach coming out in the organ with that, that great rose window and the sun shining through and was just completely, totally overwhelmed, like a mystical moment, like a, it was just unbelievable. And that happened at a tough time in my life when I was going through a divorce and things seemed pretty bleak and God had gone away from all my thoughts, and that brought me back to a sort of different kind of reality and made me think again about, you know, what am I up here in this world for anyway? And looking back on it, you know, from the years in between, that was 19, oh, when was it, 1972 or three, something like that. And I think that in that amazing piece of music, I think I heard the voice of God, which sounds extraordinary, but I think all that is, it's like our conscience, the little, small, silent voice. And it doesn't really matter if you call it your conscience, and that's dictated by your human nature, or whether you think it's this great mystical power that we call God, or I call God. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think there was a message there. And I think the message was to take, to give people hope.
including myself. Was it really like that? You you walking out of the church in Notre Dame, thinking, it, yeah? Walking out, I wasn't thinking anything about messages from God. But it did make me start to, I mean, you know, there was this exquisite music, yeah. this fantastic cathedral built at a time when they didn't have the advantage of modern architecture or machinery, sort of like the pyramids. And it suddenly seemed to me so clear to me that this couldn't be just chance, that it was, you know, the mind that caused Beethoven to write the music, my mind that was able to comprehend it, the beauty, the cathedral, the sort of feeling of the prayers of thousands and thousands of people who believed. It was just totally overwhelming. And yeah. could this all be chance gyration of matter? It seemed to me not. And so that pushed me back into a more philosophical frame, that one moment. It's amazing how you get these, these little things that happen that seem to push you in one direction or another. But I firmly believe there's choice. I could stop doing what I'm doing now. I'm not ordered, and there isn't a voice saying, Jane, do this. Mm -hmm. It's more a, a feeling. If we talk about chimps for a while, again, beauty, no way of deciding whether they experience it. No. Uh, consolation. Well, consolation, if you detach it from beauty, um, you know, it's, it means something very different, doesn't it? A young chimp certainly finds consolation in his mother's arms. Uh, a chimpanzee who's nervous or frightened is consoled by an embrace, by being patted on the back, having his hand held. So in that normal sense of consolation, the chimps need it and receive it. What kind of consolation was Mr. McGregor? looking for the last day she was living. I don't think he was looking for any. I felt desperately I wanted to console him. And all I could do was give him some food and eventually shoot him. What happened? He fell victim to polio. We think it was polio. Both his legs were paralyzed. He managed to pull himself into the trees with these amazingly strong arms. But then he dislocated one arm because he fell, and so we had to shoot him. There was something happening in between. He tried, he was seeking for consolation in the He's, group of chimps. He, what yes. happened? Yeah. We're talking now about yes, no, human-like behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he, he definitely wanted the consolation, this physical contact that is so reassuring for them. Grooming, social grooming, yeah. provides the most relaxed, friendly physical contact, and groups of adult males will groom for two hours at a time, mm -hmm. which is how they maintain their friendly relationships with each other. And this one occasion when it was before McGregor dislocated his shoulder and he managed to pull himself up into this tree where there were I don't know, three or four other adult males grooming. And as soon as he got up there, they all left because they were frightened of his disability. And he just sat there. And it was, it was a very heart-wrenching moment for me. The first time you hated chimps yes. from the bottom of your heart. Yes. I hated them. And then his brother, we presume, it was his brother, Humphrey. They'd always been together. And even Humphrey wouldn't groom him. But then Humphrey stayed when the others left. He stayed near. He wouldn't groom him, but he didn't go away. And he went back to where he'd last seen Mr. McGregor many times over the next few months because he didn't know that McGregor had died. And it was as though he was looking, waiting, listening. You remember shooting him? Yes, I'll never forget it. I didn't personally do it. No, Hugo did it. you were it. present. It was terrible. Hugo said, don't come, and I said, no, I have to. So we gave him his favorite food, which was an egg with some leaves, and he made these happy grunts. He 
He was not aware of his dying? No. Are chimps aware of dying? No. Are you sure? No. They're, they're certainly aware of death. They understand when something's dead that it's not going to move about again. But do they understand that they are dying sooner or later? No. You always say, oh, animals have such wonderful lives because they don't have our projection, our fear of death. So they're correct? Just saying that? I do not think that chimps are aware that they're going to die. Uh -huh. Right at the very end, when they're really sick, maybe, I don't know, but I don't think so. Think back of Mr. McGregor. Was he aware of the fact that he was going to die within I don't a few think days? so. No. No? I don't think so. We can't tell again. We can't. There's no way we can tell. The closest I've come to to feeling how chimps relate to death was <clears throat> two mothers who lost their babies. Ollie had had many offspring, and her infant was one who got paralyzed by the polio epidemic, lost the use of all limbs. So it was just a little limp thing, very young baby, one month, two months, something like that. And he, could, he still screamed, and he clearly was in pain. So when Ollie moved, he would cry, and she was so tender with him. And she arranged these little limp arms and legs and cradled him like this. And then at some point, when she was in a tree grooming with her daughter, he actually died, or at least he lost consciousness. He stopped screaming anyway. Uh -huh. When she came down from that tree, the difference in the way she handled the, the baby, the only different thing is that he's not screaming, or well, probably he's dead. And now this is a thing that I've got to carry around with me, but I'll hurl it over my shoulder, I'll drag it along by one leg, I'll let it mm. drop on the ground, just like that. Whereas a mother who lost her first baby, she went on treating the dead body as though it was alive. So there's clearly a moment when they come to understand that the loss of movement um, is death. Do chimps experience fun? Oh yeah, fun, and they have sense of humor too. And do they realize that they are having, realizing that they are, are they realizing that they have fun? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. Are you sure? They tumble about and laugh. Yes, I'm totally sure. They have enormous fun. They tease each other. Um, they just the enjoyment of young chimps playing is very infectious. They laugh and uh, gives everybody else fun too. So you'll see a group of humans watching two playing chimps and these big smiles on everybody's faces, the chimps' faces and the human, and even the adults, even quite a staid old adult, sometimes can't resist joining in when the youngsters get all boisterous. You'll see this staid old man kind of reaching out and tickling them as they go by. It's quite funny. What do they laugh about, chimps? They laugh about being Same tickled. as humans? Um, well, the same as human children. Uh -huh. Human children have a lot of physical fun. Mm -hmm. Chimps have a lot of physical fun. Human children have fun when they're doing acrobatics and somersaulting and things. So do chimps. Um, but the, the best example of a, a real sense of humor, I mean, you see example, little examples in the forest of big brother trailing a bit of vine, little brother is chasing after him around the tree, and every time little brother is about to catch the end of the vine, big brother jerks it away. And after a bit, little brother finds this not funny anymore and starts whimpering, and so big brother laughs. I mean, it's really quite, quite funny. But there's a story which isn't about a chimp, it's about a gorilla. And this is a captive gorilla who's been taught sign language. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Coco. And she's sitting there with a new person who's been employed to work with her and look after her and this new person of course knows the sign language and she's just idly sitting there with Coco it's nearly supper time and Coco has just learned all her colors lots of colors she knows them really well so idly as they're waiting this um, this student picks up something something blue and says what color and Coco signs blue, and then she picks So Coco goes through correctly until she picks up a white towel. 
quite snowy white. What color is it? And Coco signs red. And so she's signing, no, Coco, what color? Red. Um, Coco, you know better than this. What color is it? Red. So this the student thinks that Coco is teasing her. So she says, if you don't tell me what color it is, I'm not going to give you your juice. So Coco takes the towel from her, picks off the minutest speck of red fluff and goes, red, red, red. <laughs> Which, I mean, that is the perfect example of a sense of humor. Yeah. Sense of humor mm. is closely related to our sense of beauty. Yes, I think it is. Joy, beauty. Yeah. But beauty is more apt to make you cry than laugh. How does a chimp laugh? <laughs> like us? <laughs> And they show the button teeth instead of the top ones, like I think, because they got this floppy lower lip. So. <laughs> and they show both lots of teeth. It doesn't show his teeth. Or it doesn't show his top teeth. Uh huh. For what it. reason? It's just the way their mouths are formed. Oh, that's the only reason. Yes, I mean, we smile, and the way our mouth is formed, we tend to show our top. Whereas uh -huh. when they, they have this very droopy lip. So when they're relaxed, the lip tends to droop, so they show their bottom teeth. Uh -huh. and their upper lip is long, so it covers the teeth. When That's they're all. crying, what's the sound of crying? Uh huh. There's a, a younger chimp cry the same way his parents are crying. Yeah. Yeah? No difference. No, no difference. Aggression. Aggression? Yeah. Well, there's the, oh, 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 which is the oh, threat. And then there's a, the, there are various Very degrees, or? this hitting away sound uh -huh. movement. And um, then there's the wah bark. I don't think I can do that. It's a, it's a louder, ha, ah! ha, ah! sort of sound can be extremely intimidating if you're the object of the aggression. Uh-huh. Consolatory sounds. They don't really have those. No. No. It's done by gesture, posture, touch. Yeah, no sounds. No. No sounds for consolation. No. Anger? Well, anger is the, is the war bark and the... Aggression, that's, that can be anger. Mm -hmm. And joy, I don't mean that they're humorous, but just enjoying. Just enjoying? Just enjoying. Well, if it's it's food, a wonderful day. I'm sitting at a peak looking over a wonderful landscape like you. And they'll be silent. Life. No, no sounds? No, they're, but they're, there's a lot of sounds if it's joy over food or a expectation of food. Little kind of. Mm. And then as they start to eat, it goes to go, mm, ah, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> And these grunts continue throughout the feast until gradually they peter away. What kind of a noise is it when you invite them to a uh, meal of bananas, a wonderful pile of bananas? Well, then it's a mixture of grunts, screams, huge excitement, embracing, patting them. It's just a great orgy of contact seeking and, mm -hmm. you know, mm, then they sometimes get so excited that they get these cramps, and so they <coughs> they can't make any sound at all. Uh huh. If they say welcome, Jane Goodall, if you're returning to no, they wouldn't. Combi, they wouldn't. Is there a kind of welcome sound? Um, there's a there's a sound which they will make when they want to find out if there are other chimps around. This distance called a pant hoot, mm -hmm. and that will be responded to or not, according to who the participants of the exchange are. What's the sound they make and how do the, the others respond? Well, it's the same it's, sound or...? It's, it's, yeah, they res the, you want me to do a pant hoot? Yeah. If I've been really sad, 
and I want consolation. I think what I would probably turn to first is a dog. If I have a dog, I think the being with a dog that you love a lot and the dog right. loves you. Because you don't have to... Um, you, do, you don't have to explain yourself to a dog, and a dog senses that you're sad and fits in with your mood and is undemanding. They don't, they don't want you to explain anything. They don't batter you with um, silly condolences. They're just there. They feel sympathy. They're so close. And I think this is why when you take a dog into a hospital, a child tends to get better. Why, when you take a dog into a old people's home, it tends to bring them out of themselves. There's something absolutely amazing about our relationship with dogs, which I believe is very, very old, very ancient. And the chimps, you know, I haven't got that kind of a relationship with them. I, I'm fascinated by them. I can love them in a way, but I don't love them the way I would love my dog, because the dog depends on me. And it's this, un it's a, it's a two-way thing. I can love the chim, the chim doesn't love me. So for the kind of consolation you need when you're um, really upset. But when Derek died, all my dogs had died as well. I didn't have my dogs. They weren't there. So I went to the forest, and it was the forest rather than the chimps that I sought consolation. It was just being there, surrounded by this ancient life. When are you going back to Gombe? I shall be back in Gombe in about one month from now, and I will get a few moments of peace. I will spend time with Gremlin and the two twins, Gold and Glitter, and Fifi and Flirt. Unfortunately, there'll be an IMAX film team there. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I have to launch the Year of the African Child for UNICEF. So there'll be people. Your mission. <laughs> people. Well, where's the beauty? Where's the consolation? Out in the forest with Gremlin, Golden and Glitter. Uh -huh. And Fifi. And the forest doesn't change. You can't Very the beautiful. You're going to the peak again. I shall go to the peak, kind of pilgrimage. I shall go to the waterfall, mm -hmm. and I shall do these things alone. Again. Again. Like ever. Like ever, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you.